Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We create a capable, diverse talent pipeline by getting more women, people of color, underrepresented populations, and first generation to graduate from high school and college into the education, economic mobility, employment, and leadership pipelines. We do this in a number of different ways. Uh, one of which is we have a major annual conference every year, which this year is virtual. And this uh, program today is part of that. So we hope uh, we will see you in 2021 with all of us uh, vaccinated at that time. But uh, for now, we're very glad that you joined us here today and uh, for this panel. And this is on uh, closing the equity gap with the bold goal. And uh, Jennifer Bonaya is going to be leading this group of people. So I wanna give you just a little bit of a background on Jennifer. And I'm also, before I introduce Jennifer, wanna tell you what Global Minded's bold goal is. Uh, we had the bold goal by 2025 to algorithmically connect 25 million first-gen students, first-gen graduates, those who work with them, and those who want to hire them to role models, mentors, internships, and jobs. Because we know that no one college, no one company can do what uh, people need to be able to be connected to people who look like them, can inspire them. And uh, those are the networks that are really critical to get people to economic and financial success and stability. So that's what our bold goal is. And COVID has really let us see that we can't wait until 2025 to achieve that. We really need to achieve this within the next couple of years. This matter has really become urgent. And we're very aware with the kinds of things going on in our, in our um, nation the last couple of days with um, the George Floyd tragedy, so many other um, tragedies over the last few weeks and last few years. Um, that it's really time to, to stop um, this uh, continuation of generational racism, poverty, the kinds of things that, um, that we really have an ability right now to address and knit together in our nation. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Bonine. She is the CEO and the founder, and she's the first female artificial intelligence AI testing tech CEO of Pink Lion AI. She represents the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of Equality, Inclusivity, and Promise in AI Technology. She's respected as an industry speaker, most recently at the World Economic Forum in Davos, which is where I was able to meet Jennifer, which was great in January, and for the CNN Money Switzerland. She has held executive level positions leading teams at Oracle and Target. She is the founding member on the board of AI Girls an executive board member of Lead the Way, and she sponsors Team Women and is a council member for Dream Tank and similar organizations designed to champion young entrepreneurs. The platform is underlying technology to drive the bold goal, which is what we're dedicated to with Global Minded. Jennifer will be featured this summer at the UN's AI for Good Summit in Geneva. She was named one of the top 30 leaders to watch in 2020 she is a member of Million Dollar Women, and she is currently developing a children's book series on the adventures of the Pink Lion, a sovereign ruler who believes in educating children about the power of AI and machine learning for inclusivity for all. So join me in welcoming Jennifer. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm so honored to be here with this wonderful group of people and um, discussing this topic. It's near and dear to our heart at Pink Lion, obviously. Um, when we started Pink Lion, we see AI as the next industrial revolution. This is our fourth industrial revolution. And if we don't build and develop and deploy this technology with diversity in mind, with diverse voices in how it's built, developed, and deployed, we are not creating the type of technology that will resonate and be representative of our populations. So early on, we said at Pink Lion, we would do what we could to be that underlying platform, as Carol mentioned, to ensure that we are connecting people to the opportunities, to the jobs, creating inclusivity and diversity in how that's being done. So we're incredibly passionate about this effort and initiative. We're passionate about involving all the right stakeholders in this discussion, because as Carol mentioned, this is going to take entrepreneurial leadership, 
venture capital investment and leadership are universities being on board with this and connecting to these geographies and diversity that we need to represent all of the folks that will be required in this. So we're incredibly passionate about it. I want to get to some of the wonderful speakers we have to talk about how they feel we can further impact this from their lens. Obviously, Carol mentioned some of the things going on and this is top of mind for us. Pink Lion is Minneapolis based. As all of you, I'm sure, have heard that are watching the news, there's a lot going on here very close to home for us. Um, if you are in our downtown right now, um, it's reminiscent of what a war zone would look like. So we are being impacted deeply right now with this, and I think all of us have to come together with a constructive plan and a big goal and a bold goal to help people align to something that they feel is going to help them. And so I think this group will be able to help address some of these challenges and what we can all do to support this. So I'd like to introduce, um, with no further ado, um, the chair of the Bold Goal Initiative. It is um, the president of Motlow State um, Community College, Michael Torrance, but we like to call him Michael. So to us, he is Michael. But I'll introduce Michael um, to address um, the how and why this is important right now to help heal some of this generational racism that is currently and actively dividing the country. So Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Hello everyone, uh, greetings uh, far and wide. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for such a generous and gracious introduction. And thank you, Carol, uh, and my esteemed colleagues uh, for allowing me to join uh, this great panel. Um, Prosperity is a focus for all of us. Uh, I don't know a person who doesn't want the persons who are in their homes or their neighbors uh, not to prosper. And when we think about the use of emerging technology and the lens in which our world thrives on at this very moment, uh, it has to do with social media platforms. It has to do with the emerging tech associated with uh, extended reality. Uh, it has to do with the emerging tech platforms associated with AI, CAV technology, uh, and so on and so forth. What's really important and why I agreed to be the chairperson for the Bold Gold Initiative out of Global Mind Ed is that I understand not just the urban centers, but also the rural locales in which Milo State represents and supports. It's important for us as leaders to look at what is needed, what is necessary, and move beyond conversation and story and move towards tactic and action. So this is a call for those who are watching and those who may pass along these links that we want to do something very, very important. We don't want to just talk about generational poverty. We don't want to just talk about generational racism. We want to move towards action-oriented solutions that provide what is necessary, and that is moving, moving, movement and motion towards actionable goals. That actionable goals will assist and support all of us, no matter your height, your weight, your uh, ethnicity, your, your, your acumen. It provides access uh, through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is another important part of the bold goal. There are companies all across the globe that are in need of diversity, not simply for the sake of ethnic diversity or gender diversity, but because of thought diversity. Um, when you have groups of people who see the world and grow up and, from, and view it in different lenses, it provides us access to be creative in ways that we've never thought before. Uh, and as I've said before to groups that I see often, the ceiling is the roof. That means that there will be a roof or ceiling if we decide that that's a boundary that we're gonna set and yield ourselves to. The use of emerging technology allows us to create a landscape uh, that's a global scape, both local and global, that allows us to intuitively make intertwined uh, solutions that are to, gonna benefit all of us. So that's our why and the how. Everyone listening is the how, whether it be 50 cents, or whether it be a check from your corporation or maybe a donation from someone's lemonade stand. Everyone can contribute to the success of this bold gold initiative. We want this to be as large as possible because we want to impact, it's not only just lives, we want to impact generational poverty, as we've said before, but also make sure that we support the businesses and the industry that need the talent pools that we can grow out of community colleges, technical colleges, HSIs, MSIs, PWIs, uh, and HBCUs. So that's our how, that's our why. We want you to join us. Thank you. Okay, Michael, I'm just gonna insert one thing right here. 
just spend two minutes that you are such a role model for so many young African American males who no one in their family has gone to college just for a minute share a little bit about yourself because there's a reason that you're the you're the the person to be um, leading this cause. Well, like, like people uh, talking about yourself is very difficult. Uh, so I actually wrote this up because I knew Carol was going to ask me to do it. Um, I'm a byproduct of being a first gen student. Uh, I'm from an urban center and I grew up in a very dynamic uh, background. That's how I like to explain it. It was a dynamic background where you had to make decisions to improve the quality in which who you wanted to be and saw yourself as versus just thinking I'm only going to be this. So technology has been important across my entire life. Um, I was fortunate to go to Chesterfield County Schools at the time, uh, one of the, the best school districts in the, in the United States and got introduced to computers and coding uh, in the third and fourth grade. So from that has spun out not only an, an interest, but a, a, a passion uh, as it relates to the gaming. And it grew into what, where my children are today. Everyone knows Fortnite. Uh, so everyone knows Borderlands. So I understand that the use of this landscape from being a child to an adult uh, allows access and conversations that can be challenging conversations as well as when I'm playing this game, I don't see anyone that looks like me. So let's, let's create the scapes and places in which all of our children learn and thrive upon. Um, I'm, a, I'm a veteran. Uh, I am a, as I said before, I'm, I'm, I was a student athlete who, however that fits and works within the paradigm of our discussion, but I have a unique experience associated with wanting to support this bold goal initiative because I can speak to having been applicable, applicable in a process that moved from a dynamic upbringing to being the president of an institution. Never was my goal, but um, when you lay bricks, you must stand upon them and be ready for what comes uh, out of that fruition. And so here we are. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Michael. That was really wonderful in shaping what we're trying to do with the why and the how for everyone listening in. We'd next like to move on to Pradeep and Devar to address the internationality needed for tech to help close this gap, not widen this digital divide that we're seeing, and the personal commitment that each of them are making, um, and to share their personal authentic stories, um, as Michael just did, around how they see this impacting the venture capital space as being an entrepreneur building technology, shaping the future. So I'll first turn it over to Devar and then to Pradeep to comment on that for us. Thank you so much. It's uh, such a great honor to be here. And uh, Dr. Torrance, you're an inspiration to all of us. I have young children. I mean, not, they're not young anymore, but they went to community college and one of them studied robotics uh, technician, and that's where he's working now as an, at Applied Materials. It's really important that our young people get educated and get a skill uh, while they're in community college. It makes all the difference. Uh, my background is I was at National Public Radio as a journalist for over 20 years. My last position at NPR News was senior producer of the Identity and Culture Unit. As I looked and traveled around the country, uh, looking at the conversations around Ferguson, the conversations around, you know, uh, race relations, um, education, uh, you know, around algorithm, algorithmic justice, um, one of the things that I noticed was when we look at the future of automation, some of the pain points that public media has are going to be exasperated, are going to be even worse. So by 2022, uh, something like 25% of online interactions with, will be with virtual assistants like Siri, Cortana, Alexa. Do they speak to you? Do they speak to our children who come from many different backgrounds? For the most part, no. As we know, AI algorithms and data sets are limited in reaching us in relevant ways. So what is our responsibility as journalists, as storytellers, as technologists, as educators to come around these bold goals and put a plan together that will also make these virtual assistants a lot more interesting, a lot more relevant. And that's part of one of the projects that I'm working on um, where uh, Jennifer and Pink Lion have championed me. Uh, she held my hand many months ago when I was very scared. And she said, I have your back. 
And to me, that made a lot of difference. This is a woman who actually sticks by her word. So my background was a storyteller at NPR News. I'm now um, a founder of an AI company that is uh, literally uh, creating a culture graph, uh, cultural intelligence for AI. Today, Amazon selected me as one of their startups. So I'm very privileged uh, to be there. And uh, beyond that, I also was deputy director of the White House Presidential Innovation and Fellowship Program, where I worked across uh, 26 federal agencies to look at user engagement and customer interaction. And as you can imagine, uh, even the United States government can do a better job of uh, really reaching users, American people, and bringing we the people to artificial intelligence. That's my mission, and I'm excited to be here as part of uh, the bold goal and do whatever I can to help. And I'll send it over to Pradeep. Thank you. Um, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Oh, you're still muted, Pradeep. Thank you. Um, I have two different buttons that I need to <laughs> unpress, and finally I have unpressed both of them. Um, I am um, one of the three partners uh, with a venture firm in, uh, based in Minneapolis, uh, Great North Labs. So I'll bring the venture perspective, and given that I've mentioned Minneapolis, um, let me actually, this morning I received an email from one of our CEOs and I particularly want to kind of bring it up only because it is actually one of our women CEOs and we strongly believe in diversity inclusion uh, in every possible dimension. Um, so uh, this is um, Katrina uh, who says, um, our community is aching and our team members' hearts are heavy. We're openly talking through the events and I welcome any advice you may have on how to lead well through this. I, I, um, I'm paraphrasing it in its entirety because, uh, you know, I don't know that as a male, I would have actually sent this kind of an email to say my VCs because there is a, an attribute here which among women leaders uh, and that of inclusion, that of a 360 degree view and that of uh, you know, uh, empathy and compassion is very important, uh, particularly at the leadership levels because that's where change happens. Um, and the fact that uh, she was the one who sent us this email this morning spontaneously, simply you know, basically echoed the whole uh, topic to me. Um, moving to um, venture capital and how venture capital can deliver or, or can help deliver the bold goal. Um, we believe as venture capitalists that a entrepreneurship is an excellent way to build wealth and uh, you know well-being uh, across the entire social spectrum because it is strictly based on economic merit. It is not based on anything else. We started our firm uh, focusing on the upper Midwest, meaning that we're headquartered in Minneapolis and our target region for investing is the upper Midwest defined as extending westward from Ohio uh, and uh, you know, sort of stopping at say roughly the Dakotas and south all the way to Colorado. And the reason why we chose this was because after having, I had invested in a company uh, that my two partners had started. And um, as, we, as we kind of journeyed through the company, a few things became apparent. Capital is hard to find uh, in the upper Midwest. Uh, B, that the teams that, you know, kind of, as I would participate in board conversations here in the Valley, in Silicon Valley, or in Minneapolis, uh, what I would find invariably was the quality of the work being done, uh, sort of in our board meetings in Minneapolis, was actually better uh, than what we would typically see in Silicon Valley. What is the reason? The reason is because underdogs are always willing to work harder 
and if given a chance, when given a chance, and kind of they they will they will do much more to deliver. And we saw that consistently throughout the journey with NativeX, the company that uh, I had invested in, and my two partners, Rob and Ryan, were the uh, founders of. When they sold the company, we founded the fund, and it's very explicit, specific thesis is to invest in the upper Midwest. I'm mentioning this only because this kind of a formula is really uh, implementable in uh, regions across the world. What did we do uh, to make the fund happen? We uh, built a set of relationships among folks who had been successful in their own businesses in the region. So they had an affinity for the region. Uh, we explained to them our thesis that we were going to do grassroots uh, 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 development of startups in the region, uh, leveraging teams in the region, and ultimately the centers of gravity of these companies would be in the region. So they would contribute to the uh, economic development of the region, create hopefully several thousands of jobs uh, across the portfolio. And for sure, uh, that message resonated with our limited partners. It is exactly this kind of an activism. If you look across any other, any, any, part, any, any part of the world where a similar story is unfolding, you see exactly the same thing, whether it's in Israel or in Africa or in India uh, or in South America or in other regions of the US. Um, I happen to be, have been born in India and I left when the country was was, was, was quite poor and nowhere on the international scene. Today, it is the principal region where software development occurs. And I can say sort of metaphorically that, you know, literally around every corner of New Delhi, you can see an incubator or an accelerator. What's going on there? At the grassroots level, entrepreneurs who are hungry to uh, to, to really kind of rise economically are finding sources of mentorship, small amounts of capital, guidance, uh, and are implementing their dreams. And, and sure enough, 25 years later already, the transformation that you see that has led to this point is the transformation of a country that you know, freed itself of, uh, of colonialism uh, 60, 75 years ago. And today is in this place, and I think in 25 years, we'll be in a different place altogether. So applying that, like Jennifer was talking about, at a global level, in terms of matching capital to eager entrepreneurs with a vision and with a certain tailored understanding of the thing that they want to pursue is absolutely uh, a, is a, is a, is a, is probably, the most powerful way to build economic value at a grassroots level. Of course, it has to be supplemented with policy and it has to be supplemented with a certain amount of infrastructure, but that is our thesis. Um, just sort of a couple of um, you know, brief other points. Um, we, um, we, we implement our thesis not just by finding entrepreneurs. Uh, I live about five minutes away from Stanford University. Stanford University has probably one of the biggest endowments in the US. Um, and if you dig a little bit into its uh, tuition policy, they say very uh, sort of emphatically that any families with income less than $60,000, uh, annual income less than $60,000 will, like, will likely not have to pay any tuition for the students or the children. And families with income less than $120,000 may only pay a small part. Uh, my son went to Stanford. Uh, he did not have to, thankfully. He did not need to take advantage of this. But he said his friends, several of his very close friends, came exactly from those backgrounds. And he thrived in every minute of that experience with the diversity and the inclusion that he encountered. So in our own world in you know, the upper Midwest, uh, some of the takeaways, what do we do that maybe are small examples 
of similar things. Uh, um, two of my, my two co-founders have made a founder's pledge where they have uh, pledged their future assets resulting from the venture fund towards uh, uh, such causes. And um, I mentioned Stanford only because at Stanford, uh, kind of one of the most uh, well-oiled programs is such contributions of founder stock, which over time will say appreciate to 50X or 100X of its initial value and changes uh, the endowment of the institution and makes these funds available as I described to the students. So in a small way, uh, my two founders, my two co-founders have done that. They're involved in various um, um, inclusion organizations uh, across the state, Minnesota Cup, Beta, uh, Minnesota, Ministar, uh, Singularity, Centra Care Foundation, and, and a few others. Um, then um, we've you know, been involved and I'm talking about things that one can do. In addition to being a venture capital, uh, inviting um, diverse teams uh, and investing in them. In addition to that, uh, for example, participating in the public private kind of context with say the economic development board. Um, in our case, we have worked with uh, the Minnesota um, uh, DEED, which is the Employment and Economic Development Organization, and uh, work with them to help design their strategy to go forward and, and, and basically do various things in the ecosystem for economic development. So these are some examples. I'll pause here. Uh, I just want to like in insert one other thing real quick, Jennifer, before you go on to um, to Jessica. But uh, just Pradeep, and maybe we can come back to this. But the commitment that you and your partners have made is incredible. And one thing we can come back to it later that I would love for you to think about is what if we had a call to action where all the VCs and all the people who are investors are gonna make a commitment to financially and with time to get behind the bold goal and a couple of other things that can really move those gigantic levers of access and equity. Because your, your leadership, I don't know, you know what percentage of the VC world is your leadership and your partners, but wouldn't it be amazing if we could somehow get you know half of the VCs and funders to be able to do what you all have made a commitment to doing. If I can take one minute to respond, the I think you would get very little. Uh, you'll get. I I would submit that you'll get a lot of support from a lot of VCs uh, because um, capital at the level that we start in seed, pre seed early stage investments is of modest value. And the, the curve in this kind of value creation process can in fact become very steep over a period of time. So that 10 years later, 20 years later, you're in a very different place. The thing that was helpful to us, and I believe in this sort of idea of making this call, the thing that would be helpful to anybody who has this kind of a contribution sort of potential, whether it's a VC or folks who may have private stock um, in their portfolio that is valued at a, at, a, at a kind of modest value is facilitating the process. So at Stanford, they make it extremely easy and just sort of guide you through the process as though it's an ordinary, ordinary transaction on Amazon. Uh, and, and it is actually as simple as that. So doing, making this kind of a call and setting up a process uh, of this kind, I think can pay dividends. Um, yeah, briefly about the impact investing community, which I've been attached to quite a bit, going to Silicon Valley a lot. I think to uh, continue what Pradeep was saying, there is a huge appetite from the impact investing community right now um, but the big thing is to so show the social returns. And similar to uh, Pradeep using the analogy of uh, Stanford being like Amazon, you guys have to be the same. You have mm -hmm. to have a dashboard that has KPIs on it. You have to have the stories of Dr. Torrance's students in an AI talking about why they're changing the world. 
So Silicon Valley wants to invest in education and in diversity, but they also want to see more innovative ways of sharing your story. Um, but there is a huge appetite from impact investors to get into the education space for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Tavar and Pradeep. I was going to say, too, I think a point to be made from all of this when you hear is, um, as um, Michael stated, that this is not just about diversity and inclusion for the sake of diversity and inclusion. There's actually real tangible benefits and value that come out of it. There have been studies done that venture capital firms like Deeps and Great North Labs that invest in diverse founders actually have higher returns for their investors it's because you have that diversity of thought, because you have more customer-centered design techniques, which actually that kind of theory of customer-centered design and understanding your users leads us into one of our panelists that just joined us. But I think the point being made is um, diversity and inclusion actually does net out higher revenue in organizations. It nets out better innovation, which leads to higher revenue. There is a lot of tangible, hard benefits from having a more diverse group of people creating, building, and deploying products in our market spaces. So I'd like to now introduce a panelist that joined us. Jess, Jess can describe, she's been, she has several degrees from one of our elite universities. I'm amazed that how many she was able to achieve. She is a first gen to college student as well. Um, and would love to hear your take on the impact um, to yourself and your story and this bold goal of connecting um, our 25 million um, diverse and low income leaders who can become our future leaders. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate it. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm new to the global minded space, and I'm very excited to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm a little late because I'm at MIT. And of course, there's going to be technical difficulties <laughs> on Zoom. Of course, they're going to be. I, um, I, Jennifer, it's a, it's a big question. I'll, I'll tease it by saying that I'm all, so yes, I'm a Cuban refugee. I born in Cuba, my parents snuck me out of the islands, thank God, um, into Peru, and then I survived child trafficking there, and, and finally made it to Miami, and then I survived my parents holding me back to, to leave for college. I was one of those that had a dad who wouldn't talk to you anymore if you left home for college. And college was, of course, MIT, and uh, well, I'm really glad, that was the first time I ever stood up to my dad that way, and I'm not saying that's the thing that you should do, but teachers calling your parents does seem to work. Yeah. Anywhere in the world that I travel, the more you travel, the more you realize the power of diversity, just like you were saying, Jennifer. Then, then you realize diversity isn't really a thing. And when you look at the world, the global picture has <laughs> much more color than what our top institutions here or, or any institutions in America do. So then you realize, oh, so I'm not, it's only an uphill battle if you see it in this small frame. But in fact, you're actually helping every team that you work with, every leader that you um, that mentors you, learns from you. Every 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 experience that we have as as first gen, as as minority students, as all kinds of or underrepresented minority students, all of that adds up, and it and it just drops little seeds of of awareness and of like eye opening moments for for the people that you work with. I enjoy it. I've just come to, to resolve that I enjoy the teachable moments when I'm out in the world and I didn't go to school for teaching somebody about the power of diversity, but here we are with this amazing opportunity and this person and myself walk away better from it. I think that's amazing and so true, right? I mean, it's just about everyone comes from um, diversity of thought, as a lot of us have mentioned. Diversity of thought is so critical. So we see that full picture view from someone else's standpoint and how you see the world may be different than I see it than someone else and having those teachable moments where we get to broaden that worldview and that world picture helps everyone, you know, elevate and learn more and be better at what they're doing. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Jess, for joining us. We may come back with a few questions later as well. And we'll move on to Leah. Leah, I would like um, to talk about how you feel um, the call for founders, um, businesses um, to bring forth to be able to do this. How do we engage and summarize 
the business and societal needs across these sectors of how we engage the right people. Because again, it takes a community to do this. It takes businesses, it takes organizations that have pledged that they will be involved in diversity and inclusion to get behind a real way to operationalize that pledge. As Pradeep mentioned that his founders have done, how do we get them to operationalize and really do a tangible action towards that pledge? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. I, uh, it's so uh, interesting and inspiring listening to everybody on this panel. And I think the perspective that, that I sort of bring to, to this initiative is that I've been building out learning and upskilling solutions for about 30 years of my life for high school, higher ed, lifelong learners. But also I've been on the corporate side as an executive, hiring people, training people, right? And what, what does that look like? And it's no secret to anybody out there that there is this, there's this disconnect, right, between uh, what's happening in education and what's happening on, on the corporate side or on, or on the job side. And, and even if you are able to beat the odds and go to college, be a first generation college student, you're still uh, going to run into a, a lot of barriers and you know, it's still gonna be incredibly challenging. And a, a couple of those things I just think are very interesting. One is that you, you are still largely looking at opportunities within your zip code, right? And when I go out and I talk to students and I've talked to thousands of students and you ask them, what are they going to, you know, what are they going to do? How are they thinking about life? Almost anybody that you talk to, they really kind of say, well, you know, my primary influence is my family. Their primary network is their family. And, and so you can already see that, that right out of the gate, you're limited in terms of the strength and the breadth of the network that you have, that, 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 that it really comes from your you know, immediate relationships. And that whole idea that things are very uh, restricted to, the, to, to your zip code is the thing that really continues to set up and promote that generational poverty issue that we were talking about earlier on in the call. Um, and so I think one of the things that is so exciting to me about the work that we're doing with, with Global Minded or, and, the, and the bold goal is that we're trying to figure out how do we expand student networks? How do we help them connect to people who, are, who have similar backgrounds, who have similar interests, who maybe have similar skills? Maybe they're in a place that they are interested in learning more about, but don't, but don't have a way to connect with that particular person because of their limited network, right? And even the network that you build out in school is still pretty limited, right? And, um, and schools can still only do so much to help people expand and get, and get the knowledge and the information and the connections that they need. So we're sort of looking at this at Global Minded almost like an e-harmony for uh, connecting people around jobs, model, uh, role models, internships, and mentors, right? How do you find people with similar interests, similar culture, similar background? Maybe you grew up in the same place. Maybe somebody is in a different place now. How do, you, how do we help people connect with them? And when I think about this from sort of the corporate perspective, when I was uh, you know, a hiring manager, you know, hiring hundreds of people, training hundreds of people, uh, I know that certainly at almost every company, diversity and inclusion is absolutely a goal. It's something that everybody talks about. Everybody aspirationally wants to do something around that, around that front. And you know, you as a corporations, you sign up pledges, you sign, you sign up to goals. You, you know, you absolutely have the best intentions to make certain things happen. But the reality is, a lot of it is. Uh, you know, for lack of a better word, I think some, some of it is just sort of window dressing. Some of it, it you know, uh, it's, it, it's very hard to make that happen at a, at, an, at a very practical level. Not for lack of trying, but because there is just this disconnect between the students and, you know, and, and the corporate world, if you will. So I think that um, one of the things that if, if, you know, when I think about employers of any size, but, but certainly the big employers, I think one of the things that we can do right out of the gate 
that would certainly facilitate this bold goal is if you enlisted or promoted, got people within your organizations to volunteer to be these mentors, these people who we can connect with other people, other students from all different backgrounds, uh, regardless of, of where they are. And, uh, and I know that, that so many people who work at these companies are anxious, they're excited, they want to be mentors, they want to give back to the community, they want to make connections, but they don't have a, a real practical or efficient way to do that. And I, I, you know, and so I think our hope is that that's what we're building out with the eHarmony here at, at Global Minded is that we'll be able to put together that practical, efficient, smart way, an easy way for people to make those connections. Because when you can make those connections, and, 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 and I know some people, when they think about mentors or whatever, that they think, oh, it's like a three-year commitment, it's a long time. We're, yes, it could be, but we're also just talking about, sometimes these are just con quick conversations. Sometimes these are just you know, connections where you get to hear somebody else's story. You get to, you know, understand somebody else's journey, somebody that, that is similar to you. And there's huge power in that. But we need, you know, thousands of, you know, people uh, who are in jobs today to sort of become these mentors so that we can connect people. And then you start to make the connections around jobs and around internships and around, you know, how, wh what are the things that I should do? How should I think about learning? How should I think about preparing myself? And that is really the best way to access capable, a capable, diverse talent pipeline. And so the, in the end, it's actually not super hard to do, right? But we've got to get a lot of people to do it. And I think one of the, the benefits to Global Minded is that Global Minded is this great organization that connects with all of these diverse students from across the board. So it's, it's incredibly additive to what even schools are doing today, but we all know that even, even one school, it, it, you know, has a limited amount of resources, a limited amount of ability to expand people's networks. And, and Global Minded is really this huge tent that any school can fit under, any student can fit under, any corporation can fit under. And, and because it's so broad, we're able to create a much bigger network for people to connect to. That's amazing. Thanks, Leah. That, and I think that's a great thing to take note of for any of you listening that, you know, you can be these mentors and it doesn't have to be this massive commitment, but you can step up as an individuals in corporations to be a part of this. And it makes a difference. There are so many stories every day of what one connection did to change a person's future and their life. So making that even just that one connection and saying, I'm connecting you to this person can change the trajectory of that person's life significantly. So we shouldn't underestimate even just the smallest amount of time, the impact that it can have for people. And as all the panelists have talked about here, we need partners to do this. We need the venture capital community to step up and do some of the similar things that we've seen with Great North Labs and what Pradeep and his partners are doing. We need the university's participation as we've talked about with Motlow State University or State Community College and what they're doing with Devar and what she's doing and the technology that they're building that's inclusive with Jess and what they're doing with their design-centered principles and designing a world that represents all of the individuals. So taking all of this in mind, we have partners at the UN, Carol, we have the International Labor Organization, we have the World Academy of Arts and Science on board, we have um, needs for other partners. So I think what we want to summarize with for people watching is, you know, there may be people that want to get involved, those organizations like PwC and others who the CEOs who have signed these diversity and inclusion pledges, stepping up and being a part of this and taking action. You know, um, looking at the other organizations that can do things similar to sign that pledge and get involved in this to bring forward the mentors, to bring forward the jobs and the opportunities to connect those to our first gen students will be incredibly important in this effort. 
And then I would turn it over to Carol to say, how do we help people if they want to get involved because they've been inspired from this group and you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, right? With COVID-19 and then the things we're seeing right now around the country today, this is a call to action that has to happen sooner rather than later. I don't think we've even hit the tip of the iceberg because we have not even gotten to the point where the US funding that was given out to individuals has run out yet. When people start to see further economic distress, when we see further distress and people being displaced from their homes, their jobs, this is going to accelerate the need even further, I believe. So Carol, any advice for how people can get engaged that listened out there now to rally to this cause and participate in this? Sure, absolutely. Well, if you're an individual, you can become a member of this. You can also write us and say, hey, I want to be part of the committee of people that are growing um, to be part of this. If you're a leader within a company, we have company memberships where you could be part of the bold goal and you can also be um, a sponsor of the different 15 colleges like Motlow College is one of um, 15 college collaboratives that Global Minded has to bring what we call the hidden curriculum to historically black colleges, Hispanic serving institutions and minority serving institutions. So um, that's you know, another way, but um, those are some of the big ways. And then I think if you're somebody involved in one of these larger organizations, like we know we need to be partnering with AARP. They have 39 million members. If 10 million of their 39 million members were mentors by area to our uh, first gen and low income students, that right there would be amassing you know the numbers we need another big partnership that is on our radar screen is with um you know we're going to have a session with them on tuesday but the pell institute and coe the council for opportunity and education they work with the 10 million you know a year pell eligible students well those are the students that we can be connecting to those role models mentors internships and jobs so I think what we realize right now is lots of, have, lots of things have been done the last couple of decades um, in diversity and inclusion. Um, Pamela Newkirk, we featured a story on her a couple of weeks ago. She wrote um, Diversity Inc. about you know, the billions of dollars squandered by DNI programs the last couple of decades. So we don't have a lot to show for all of these sort of well-meaning things that haven't resulted in knitting together our nation in a way that we really believe at a time like this where COVID has really broken open so many different systems that, that this is a time where this bold goal and Global Minded and partners like Think Lion and each of you can really be what heals America. And I just, you know, earlier today, I said, you know, America is sick from more than COVID. We're sick from a number of things right now. We gotta be really real about that. And um, you can't pro solve problems you don't know exist or you're not real about. So I would say if you're um, part of an organization and you can see a bigger way where you can play ball with us in this, um, we would really like to work with you. And we're gonna be, um, working with NSF Includes and some other um, partners to really get this launched to get our first million um, established with this and Jennifer leading with Devar leading that AI, you know, in the next year, because we really consider this very, very urgent. We can't sit around and say, we're fine delivering this in 2025. You know, so many of these students um, have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. And many of their um, universities are at risk, their programs, their basic support systems, and many of them are not even as secure in their own homes as they are in their university situations. So we consider this to be you know, urgent and uh, look forward to really prioritizing it with each of you. And we also know that um, when people are frustrated and there's riots going on, these different things happen, we have to attach to actions that can really deliver solutions that are needed to transform the difficulty. And this is one of those things. We're not just talking about things. We are people who know how to mobilize very large solutions. So those are some different ways you can get involved. You can write um, to us through the globalminded.org website and based on um, your interests, your abilities. Um, we also have donor advised fund um, set up through the SDG Impact Fund. Um, but we would love to hear from you in whatever way you are interested in contributing and being a part of this. 
So should we go to some, some Q and A? Yeah, let's take some Q and A. Hopefully from the folks listening in, they have some questions. Um, okay. For our group. Let me, uh, I'll read them to you, Jennifer, and then we can just go. At what, one is from April Boy Naranja. She's been with us for several years. She said, Leah, great analogy. And then this, this is her next question. As a college professor, um, how do you encourage universities to volunteer to help the younger students coming up after them while the college student is trying to graduate as well? Anyone want to take that one on for us? Jessica, since you're closest to that age level. Thanks, Jessica. And Carol, since I spent four years as an admissions ambassador for the office of MIT. That's um, right. No, I mean, listen, I see it in my, in my kids every day. I live as a resident advisor on campus, and the, I get so much from giving my time to these students. I always learn from them. Not only am I up to date on most of the cool lingo, um, I think I see the benefit firsthand. And so for the university, for the university principals or leaders, you have to paint that picture, right? Um, and for the, the, the graduating students, they're trying to graduate, but it's kind of like when you don't take a study break, right? Say that you have this big test and like 10 deadlines on Friday. So you go the full week or like, the, you know, full three weeks with like just study, 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 study. That's just not gonna be as effective as if you pull back, take your foot off the gas for a little bit, wind down, relax. They see things from different perspectives. And so changing up the different balls that you're juggling makes it so that when it comes time to produce as your own college student, as in your own work, your, your, new, what is it? your nutrition has come from multiple sources, right? Not just whatever terrible snack food you had at the library. It comes from a more holistic or, or, or just all-encompassing um, ability. I think the college students, if they haven't tried mentorship, maybe you can offer a small stakes, small commitments, bridges to getting to um, students or to helping under uh, younger college students. And I would just generally talk about, you know, just you get what you put into things. So the more that you give um, and you put into something, that investment really does come back tenfold in perspective, again, in nutrition for the soul, um, and in realization, right? It's a reflection. Often we find ourselves in our mentees and we're able to say, oh my gosh, this person is doing this thing and I can't help them through it, but I was doing that thing just a year ago myself and I didn't even notice that. And so it brings us awareness into who we are um, and, it's, and it's a great mirror. So I would say it's, it's a great leadership development opportunity for any, any older students, for sure. Um, I would also say use the power of social media, which is your tool and, you know, that's what you know, to help get the uh, 3.2 billion people who are unconnected and not on the internet, uh, you know, to advance. Because we have to remember that there really only is 60% of the world that is online. And now COVID teaches us that even communities in America can't get educated uh, because they don't have laptops or they're not connected. And I think that uh, students in universities can tell these stories using social media to get people to understand the importance of it and really not, not pulling at heartstrings, but this is your generation. Do you want half of your generation not to get educated because they don't have access to laptops or the kind of education and, uh, you know, you know, um, opportunities that a Stanford student has. And really, I want to really hear from Dr. Torrance because you live this every day. And, you know, what would you like to see university students doing more of to uh, bring more visibility to the global goals? Well, thank you for, for the softball you just tossed me. <laughs> well, for, for the students that we see every day, uh, we talk about the importance of not just knowing about where they want to transfer and where they want to go to work, but it's very important for us to know their names. So we move beyond the whole idea and the ideology behind uh, just getting you in, getting you through, and getting you out. So input, throughput, and output. For us, it's about connectivity. And I think that that's a, an operative word to use when we're talking about the bold goal and, what, and our attempts and what we're going to accomplish. It's about connectivity. It's not just about your block. 
It's not just about your apartment building or your neighborhood, um, but asking universities and community colleges and technical colleges as well, uh, irrespective of their Carnegie de designation, what place in which do you see yourself fitting as a role and in what role do you see yourself working as? Because there's so many opportunities and options that we can provide students through being incubator spaces, being maker spaces, uh, being entrepreneurial in our mindset. And if you don't think about the intelligent design or the universal design approach to what we do every day as educators and or leaders, then we kind of miss the boat and we skip a lot of steps going from the idea to let's assess that. There's a lot of conversation and dialogue to be had but that dialogue and conversation shouldn't just to be about the story. It must be action oriented. And so that's where, we're at, where I stand with the opportunities that present themselves for the baseline and the general education uh, products that we produce out of community colleges that have a focus and intentional effort on robotics, advanced manufacturing, uh, engineering. Uh, some of these students have gone on to become rocket scientists. Uh, and transfer to uh, some of the, the, the highest recognized institutions in the nation. And it's not about where you start, as we know, right? We can all say that. It's about where you finish, and it's how you finish. And it's important that if there are students that are going to watch this, uh, along with those who want to invest themselves, because more importantly, it's not just about uh, resources and dollars and cents. Um, what you can give as an individual, as a mentor, or as an access point or pivot point for a university or a secondary institution to send diverse uh, individuals so that they can help you with quote unquote your bottom line. Um, if you have never seen it or experienced it, it's hard to create it. So uh, diversity is important for that, uh, that fact alone. And I think that that's beneficial, not just to corporations, uh, but just to us as communities. Totally. It's like the, the quote, you know, you have to see it to be it. And if we were all live in a few weeks in Denver, you'd see that like 60 some percent of the people walking around are people of color and a bunch of people who are first gen have big stars on their name tags so that people can see all these role models they may not see at their um, high school or college. So Awesome. Well, it looks like, okay, maybe let's see if there's one more and then we'll, well, then we'll wrap. We've got three minutes. Okay. Um, this is from Jonathan Blackwood and he's part of a uh, global minded young professionals. He is also an MIT grad and then went to medical school. He says intergenerational discounting or disc discounting say it tends to be an Achilles heel of societies that individuals are more motivated by immediate personal gain as opposed to delayed gratification or collective future benefits. What is our best tool to motivate people to care right now? I want to jump in right away. Um, one of the best motivators is something that is a, an organic and innate human need. Uh, what can we give to each other? We can give time to each other. Um, we can give passion to each other. Uh, and these are some of those caveats that can't necessarily be measured. Uh, but I know there are two things about the people that I work with and the students that I see every day. They talk about time and they talk about money. So the giving has to be something that's equated. Uh, and the equity that's in that is an equity stake in that for companies that may want to look at this as an option. How do you look at a student and provide that student the opportunity to earn while they learn uh, and not just simply supporting their their venture but providing them with the opportunity to grow develop and become the mentor as they've been the mentee uh, and, and help your your industry grow and is that an option an opportunity for that student to actually become an entrepreneur i, I love the idea i'm a serial serial entrepreneur myself and there's no cure for being an entrepreneur you you are one that is just in your blood so this idea of being able to create the space and people and what you want to see happen in the world through those that you, as Jessica has, has alluded to, you can connect with that person because you're just like, you're living out my life that I used to be in and I want to help you become successful. Uh, and, and that manner of success is, is, is based on whomever and however you design uh, success for yourselves. Awesome. Any, anybody else for that one for Jonathan? And then we can wrap. 
Okay. Well, what we'll do is we'll make sure this is part of the Global Minded 2020 uh, YouTube event channel. And so this will be posted. And actually, I have to give a little shout out to Jessica because she's going to be featured in our newsletter tomorrow since she's part of the uh, Boston 30 Under 30. And she bagged three different degrees in engineering from MIT. So we're telling her story tomorrow because these are the ways that our students who start their program a week from today, they see people like her and uh, they get excited to be part of um, what's going to be happening for them next weekend. So, um, but uh, Jennifer, I just want to thank you so much for putting this awesome panel together and for being our AI partner and for all the other partners like Devar and Pradeep and everybody else that you work with in your orbit, which is expansive. And, um, and just to say from, you know, Celeste and Lisa and Kirsten and all the different folks involved at Global Minded that we really believe we are a network of incredibly diverse, incredibly talented people that can basically get any major thing done and delivered. And um, that's what I think um, this group is kind of the inner circle to just make that happen concentrically. So we'll be uh, following up with each of you and we'll figure out how we can get those teams. And under Michael's leadership with this and Leah helping us with Global Minded and, and um, Jennifer on the tech side and um, people like Jessica connecting us um, with MIT and the different people in her world um, from Pradeep in the VC world and Devar in the social. Uh, it's an incredible group of people. So thanks to all of you. I hope you guys have a great weekend and let's just uh, send the best out that we can knit our nation and our world together through this initiative and other initiatives that are as major and as scalable to move those major levers of access and equity and that we, we can do it. So thanks again so much to all of you for your commitment and I uh, hope you guys have a really, really good weekend. Thank you. Take so care. Bye-bye.